Keep the shelling and bombing go on, a great many people are being executed, maimed, and exiled from their homes, including the women, the children, the elderly. If we've reached the dreadful point where the honor of the state and the conscience of the people collide, then what does honor mean anymore? We're asked to believe it is dishonorable to, to depart and risk the safety of Vietnamese political and military leaders, but honorable to go on contributing to the certain death and misery of the holy innocent. We are asked to believe that better arrangements with the Russians are worth the loss of our own sense of moral identity. There does come a time when the heart must rule the head. That time is when the heart is about to break. And what he did was sit and stare at that typewriter. And he did it for hours and hours. And he, uh, that was, you could look at that and say, that's, that's a pretty easy job. Except until you looked at his face. He just had this extraordinary intellect of being able to take abstract ideas and and explain them and he understood I think he understood what America was all about I mean I think he really felt America in his bones unique and it was a very important part of the way CBS wanted to present news and they were not going to listen to the naysayers and they were not going to uh, allow them to to, uh, to diminish the importance of what Eric Severide brought to the newscast. A year ago Americans in a big majority didn't want to hear about Watergate, a silly episode overblown by an overzealous press and the president's opponents. Six months ago the scandals were taken more seriously but the common comment was that it was typical of American politics, and the opposing politicians have done it too. Eric was not caught up in how he looked on camera. He was caught up in what words he used. And he was fond of saying, never forget on television, everybody gets focused on the picture, everybody's focused on the screen, but there's a speaker on that box. A lot of his pieces that he wrote were extremely sophisticated and very urbane and sort of shocking when you hear them today. Because he wasn't a newscaster in the way any of us know being a newscaster, he was very much yeah. an asset uh, to the newscast. And all of us in news knew that he was a unique asset to the news. to look into the physical universe, into the future with much more clarity. The stars will be closer. It would be reassuring if we could feel the same way about Hamburger Hill, that from its summit we could see the future of this war more clearly, that peace would be closer. There seems some doubt about that. I think he was just an amazing man. I think he was really honest. I think he didn't expect people to do things for him. I think he expected to do it himself. And I think he was a really great writer, which is something I'm not sure you can teach. I mean, it's in you or it's not. I'll never forget sitting there at lunch one time when he said to me, always remember, freedom of the press is, is the most basic and the most important freedom that we have because it makes defense of all the other freedoms possible. I mean, not many people would just say that over lunch. Uh, it might be something you'd say in a speech. But that's, those were the kinds of things that Eric Severide thought about, and those were the kinds of things that he talked about over lunch. Some officers and observers took bitching and complaint in the ranks as proof of low morale. Others knew better that the real danger comes when men sit silent, dull-eyed, no longer caring. And so this was a very difficult time, and if a fellow thinking as much, and whose job was to think of what it all meant, of course that burdened him. Of course that's why he didn't talk to Dan Rather when they went out and fished. He was thinking of something else. He also was flesh and blood. Uh, he could talk to princes or showgirls. He could talk to presidents or janitors. And um, he did love life. Eric was the one that just, I don't know, he seemed to take me under his wing or he just, he was always aware and always made sure that I was included and uh, you know, would say, would you like to have tea? And he, there was just something, I just gravitated towards him. I'm sure he was a great dad somehow, I just feel it. He loved to hunt and fish. He was as good a wing shot as I've ever seen. 
and he was a very good with a fly line. Uh, he knew the ways of the trout. He loved to be in the woods and in nature. You never heard him gossip. He would occasionally tell a wry story, but he was interested in the events of our time, and he took the news very seriously. I think that's what that made him the, the journalist and the towering figure that he was. You know, that when you're under pressure, when you're under attack, as, as we were during the, those days, during the Nixon administration, that the best defense for a reporter is to make sure you have got the story and got it right. The Nixon administration died of self-inflicted wounds. The bottom line in the social contract between the people and their chosen leaders is integrity. In the absence of that, the most impressive acts of statesmanship are not enough. The whole art of government, said Jefferson, consists in the art of being honest. As for Richard Nixon, the man, what we are seeing in the words of one White House official today is a case of psychic suicide. Eric was a man of words. He knew the value of words and he taught me to try to make myself committed to a lifetime of writing. When it comes to journalism, writing is the bedrock of the craft. As he himself said, uh, democracy demands more of its citizens than any other form of government. And that's quite true. Uh, but we don't always live up to that responsibility. And he was the, he was the person who was calling us to our duty, in a way. I had listened to him all through World War II. I had listened to them all, Albert Davis, and even the ones that are not as remembered, the Gabriel Heaters of the world and all the others. We, these were our heroes. These were the people we listened to, the, the Hans Kaltenborns. This was very important stuff. He taught me, I'm not sure it's his line, but it was, um, you walk the soil, you feed the soul, The small brown river curled around the edge of town. The farmers plowed close to the muddy banks and left their water jugs in the shade of the willows. There is not much shade in northern sections of North Dakota, nor is there much shelter in the wintertime. Even as very small children, we could sense the river's life-giving nature and meaning to the farmers, to us all. Velva, nobody knew where the town's name came from. I suspect it was a pretty sound of a wife of some early settler was one of those various villages strung along the river's wandering length. But naturally, we felt we exercised particular rights to the possession of its flowing. On the red painted wooden bridge leading into the city park was mounted a large sign bearing a white star and the words in block letters, Star City on the Mouse. North Dakota invented him, Velva invented him, and we're now here. And there's not much to see any longer in Velva, but people will get a feel of the small town that produced him. I mean, it was a very, a nice town. I think you got to know, you get to know people, you get to know your neighbors, everyone helps one another. Uh, he had that the library behind his father's office. He used to go, he just read and read and read. He never forgot where he came from. He never forgot North Dakota. You know, it's in the heartland, so I think he, he understood that, being in the middle of America. So I think he always, he always had a sense of of, of, of Americans and who they were and who he was. I think Velva had everything to do with it. I think um, growing up in a place where you had to assess situations honestly and generate solutions yourself, I think that's really central to being a good journalist. Uh, though. Severide was from Velva. He was not of Velva. When he left, he became almost instantly a man of the world. It was unique. Uh, he was uh, a cut flower in a vase and uh, will be seen no more.